Hey everybody, welcome back to the Benos podcast and today is another big time episode with Maurizio Gerardini. Uh, with Maurizio, we talked about his career in terms of longevity and the crucial components of a long lasting uh, executive career. We talked about hiring coaches and scouting coaches, some factors that he looks for and considers when before making a decision. Uh, important important uh, details to look for. We talked about roster makeup. We talked about approaching Final Fours and dealing with loss after Final Four. Lots of good examples about uh, handling people and communicating with people. So please tune in, share this episode. There's a lot of goods here, not only for executives, but also for players and uh, probably other parts of, of the game as well that, that are interested in these kind of nuances. Uh, I appreciate you being here. If you like this episode, please subscribe, please share, and uh, I'll see you soon. Bye. Action, Maurizio. Welcome to my podcast. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Benas, for having me. It's uh, it's always, uh, let's say, stimulating, you know, sharing sharing thoughts with you. Yeah, it's it's uh, my my audience is there's a wide range, a wide spectrum of 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 people who are in the sports business. So today we're going to explore a little bit uh, your job and your profession and your background, and uh, hopefully talk about some nuances that can help other probably more executives than 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 coaches. But sometimes it can work vice versa as well when coaches listen to executives talk. So hopefully we can widen their horizon a little bit today. Well. I'm I'm ready. Let's you know. Let's get started. Okay. Uh, so, I wanted to start off with your with career longevity. Uh, your career is easy for me to remember. I looked it up. Um, 1983. I was born, and uh, 1983. You started your first GM job in Forley, and uh, it's been so 39 years. I assume, right? Unless you were doing something else beforehand that was associated with uh, with the GM or executive job. But as far as I saw, it was more assistant coach uh, at Forley. And to me, you know, the, the, the longevity of a career is crucial. And there's many mistakes that can be made along the way. What did you feel like were crucial decisions in throughout your career that help you to, to be successful and to stay at this level for a long time? Well, you know, I think... Um... You know, I think uh, it's it's a combination of uh, of different different factors. Uh, of course, uh, over a span of uh, forty years, the the business has changed dramatically, and uh, not only the business but also the the world has changed dramatically. Uh, uh, sometimes when I when I try to explain that when I got started uh, as a as a young assistant coach in 1974, so that's almost 50 years ago. Uh, you know, n- nothing of today's technology was there. I mean, uh, uh, forget you know. Okay, you, you probably are thinking about, let's say, I don't know, the iPhone or the iPad or whatever. But at that time, there was no computer either. I mean, there was uh, no fax. I mean, there was, you know, those were the times where the only uh, uh, techno- techno- technology was probably the <laughs> a piece of paper where you just just taking notes and and. And my 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 first my first job was like uh, sitting on a bench as a potential let's say translator for the only American player that the team basically were allowed to have at that time, and my job was basically to communicate uh, with this player and help the coaches to communicate with him, and. Uh, Unfortunately, unfortunately, or luckily, midway through the season, our head coach had a health issue, very important health issue, and uh, we had no budget. It was a small town team, my hometown team, and and they promoted the assistant coach to head coach, and and they asked me to be the assistant coach, and uh, and I found myself uh, mid midway through the, my very first season to be. The assistant coach of a team, and don't ask me, but we found a way to win, 
to win the league and be promoted to A1, you know, and that was a big celebration in town because it was totally unexpected, but it was also something completely unexpected for me and for my life. But uh, I think as, as life move, moves on, uh, it's all a matter of, uh, let's say, timing, opportunities, uh, the people you are surrounded by and the people you need to communicate with on, on, on a daily basis and the people that eventually you are trying to learn from. And uh, I always, uh, you know, when I look back, uh, as Steve Jobs would, would say, you know, you look at all the points, you know, the, of your life and you look back, uh, you know, it's been an, an amazing, an amazing ride, but I, I think I've been blessed by having um, owners or presidents that uh, became uh, significant mentors in my life. And at the same time, great coaches to work with and learn from, and eventually great players to, to to deal with and that, uh, you know, translated sometimes uh, dreams and, and expectations into reality. But I feel, I feel extremely lucky, extremely privileged. But uh, looking back again, because you are forcing me to look back at 40 years ago, because, and by the way, the year was, that I started was 81, 82. So it's basically, I passed the 40 years barrier, but that doesn't change anything. But uh, uh, I think it took also, um, I think the secret is, uh, is understanding that there is an opportunity and not being afraid of uh, taking the challenge. Um, life is made of challenges and uh, uh, the big challenges, smaller ones, but uh, Every day is a challenge, but uh, when you when you go back and you look at your career, you know you understand that that uh, you had to you know somehow find a way to face your challenges and make decisions. And uh, in doing so, uh, you know you have to be surrounded by the right people. Uh, you have to do your own thinking because. It's how you feel inside that determines at the end of the day your, your choice. And then you always have to be a little bit uh, luck in what uh, you end up deciding, you know, because um, again, um, when I go back and I think about, you know, uh, my early years as assistant coach, I was I was enjoying that role, but I wasn't fully understanding what I could actually do in basketball. Um, I was uh, I was even thinking for a moment that I could turn into a coach, and um, you know, in in my let's call it uh, spare time, I was uh, uh, translating books for coaches. I was uh, basically putting together the magazine for the coaches association. Um, I was involved in organization of the first uh, coaches clinics in Italy, the first camps, you know, and I remember the first coaches clinic with uh, someone like Chuck Daly, you know, I mean, you're talking about uh, legendary people. And, um, but then again, I, I thought coaching was, uh, was a dream it was someone something that I was looking at until looking at yourself into a mirror you realize that uh, maybe is not exactly in line with uh, the type of personality of person you are and uh, the type of uh, curiosity that you have because I think uh, it's very important in life to always be curious. Anything you deal, anything you deal with, curiosity is a 
is a let's call it x factor that moves things around uh, in a very significant way so i i would always tell young people to be curious everything they face whether it is on the court or off the court we are talking about basketball we're talking about life in general and um, and i remember when uh, we selected as a coach um uh one of the best italian uh coaches with for young young players in the sense that he always worked with young players in rome and never got out of rome but he was a great maestro you know of fundamentals and, and we convinced him for the first time to move out of rome and come to come to forli my hometown and his name was giancarlo asteo and uh, and i remember when he got to forli and 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 i was basically i had been the assistant coach through the previous 7 8 years whatever and uh, and i asked him hey uh, coach how you know how can i help you you know don't feel any pressure to tell me you know what i should do and he goes well actually i would need two of you i said what do you mean yes i would need you as an assistant coach but i would need you as someone in between the we had a board of 35 owners who represented the life of our hometown you know doctors lawyers politicians you know so uh, you can imagine a board a board of 35 people and he said and coach Asteo said i never moved out of rome i don't know how to deal with people i would need someone in the middle between them and me and then i would need you as a, as an assistant I say hey coach you know you tell me what i should do well maybe considering this picture i would need you more as an in between guy why don't we go to the president and ask him to make you sport director or gm at that time we weren't even using the word G- general manager and uh, the president at that time uh, who was a famous pneumologist uh understood and did not understood but understood the the request it took him a few days to elaborate with the rest of the board and then they said okay let's let's have our first you know gm and that's how that's how thing got started you know It's a lot of things to unpack here but without going too too much you know like like it's a tree and we're going in, in a lot of branches here but Uh first things first Wikipedia needs to be updated because they have you as 83 starting the target position so whoever is listening update Wikipedia please um there was one thing that that uh jumped out at me that you were a doer at a young age so you were doing different things around basketball that opened up different avenues and it whatever sparked your curiosity at that time it sounds like you were going into that direction whatever you felt like was drawing you towards it whatever it was at that time which it was a camp or or organization or uh coaching for 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 a part so the curiosity in my in 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 the regard that i look at it is also probably a key factor i i encourage everybody to have a wide i call it and i've li- I've, it's not my term but i've listened to it i've heard it is uh, a wide spectrum of in- information diet you know like when you eat a diet when you eat certain things all over you missing other nutrients in your body but if you have an information diet that's a, a wide spectrum and you have from different avenues of life it helps you in your job it helps you to have a different perspective on things it has a different feeling for people understanding from a different perspective and i think that's what um to a lot of to some people it comes natural some people have to learn it i think that it sounds like to you it came natural that one thing led to another and you just wanted to do things to be active in the basketball community and then things uh, as opportunities approach you you made the decision you know sometimes you have to say no sometimes something that sparks your curiosity you say yes correct is that yeah i i always i always look at that initial time as probably what i would call the best uh, palestra time that i could actually have because the clubs were totally uh let's say were minor entities if compared to today's reality and and there were 
concepts that there were concept to become you know today everybody is uh, using words like marketing ticketing uh, media at that time you know <laughs> at that time was much much uh, let's say down to earth uh, description hey how do we sell one ticket how can we find some money because we need money to survive you know and and i i remember i was spending all my let's call it free time uh, in the club uh, you know because uh, the club was actually two people and uh, and i had a chance not only to do basketball on the court but try to understand uh you know the other side of of the organization of the club and uh i think it you know it helped me tremendously uh to understand even the simple rules federation rules you know registration rules understanding and also uh what was a big value in that beginning was living inside a locker room and and living let's say outside of the locker room but learning from connecting with people learning how to deal with personalities learning how to deal especially as a young young person that is extremely valuable you know learning how players react coaches think uh how fans see you how media criticize you how sponsor you know are ready or not ready to support you and uh, again this sort of learning i think was very very valuable as time went on in in in, in my life you know as 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 a basketball person so let's let's talk about the locker room part it's specifically about the coaching because i um by the time our 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 episode comes out david blatt's episode will be will be already published i talked to david uh, yesterday and he talked about being a judge of character uh, in terms of when he hires his staff when he hires his the, the people around him and having a feel for for people what are the, some of the main qualities that you look for when you're hiring a coach what are some things that from your experience throughout your career when you are evaluating different coaches whether they are already at a high level or not but maybe there's also that you have a perspective and opinion about younger coaches that you observe what are some qualities that jump out at you and that you find uh, crucial for a successful coach well <clears throat> i think um by the, i had david as a coach so that's a good example <laughs> <laughs> no david uh, was a was a very special coach and a very special person so but again uh, it goes back to understanding i think uh, um, you know i would be mentioning uh, uh, in our in our chat uh, over and over certain uh, concepts that i think are at the base of trying to be successful or having an extra opportunity to succeed and i already told you about curiosity i already told you about challenge another thing is communication so i think you are looking you're looking to coaches in first place understanding what type of communication you can generate what type of communication you can develop in the interest of your own club you know it's not an it's not a personal interest and um, i think uh, you know the type of communication that you establish with your own coach is at the base of of everything and um i would give you the example of someone like uh, Zelko Bradovic we at the end of the day we we worked together almost 10 years and uh, is probably is probably is the greatest coach in international basketball and uh, there was not one day that uh, it started without an opportunity to communicate without me stopping by his office or him coming to my office and talk about something evaluate something um that was uh, or me going 
to the practice site and sit down and he would always find a timeout to share. So the sharing part is critical in order to be successful. And that's what you're probably trying to figure out when you approach or evaluate a new coach. It's not only how, how he thinks in terms of X and O's, but also how he can communicate, how you feel like you can relate to him. Then, of course, you have uh, other needs and the needs are in line with your specifically with your uh, uh, with the reality that you are managing. So the, the size of your budget, the type of players that you have under contract, what the coach eventually think thinks in terms of how he wants to play the game. If that you think it fits your, you know, picture, uh, how your, your thinking evolves through the next one, two, three season, if that goes in line with the coach's thinking. Um, quite frankly, I try to follow the coaches the, the same way I follow the players. I mean, I used to, because now I'm a, let's say I'm in a different position, but, uh, but uh, I always kind of follow, follow them through their careers the same way that I follow the players. I always like to follow their uh, media statements, how they think, how they react, or sometimes I even went to coaches clinic because again, another concept there is always something that you can learn every day from every angle in any situation of this business, whether it's uh, technical stuff or marketing or ticketing or social media. So I even, you know, I like to go and listen to coaches or to follow them uh, on their, uh, let's say, video stuff just to, to get a feel of the, co of the coaches. Uh, I can share a, a story uh, when we when we selected uh, to go for Obradovic and uh, the CEO of our company in Treviso, Benetton, said uh, uh, he looks like, uh, you know, uh, he looks like a very, very aggressive, uh, you know, strange uh, kind because, you, you know, uh, I don't know him. I need to have a feeling. I said, hey, hey uh, let's go. Come with me. We're going to go and watch a game of him. I think it was, uh, they were playing a game in Paris. So we flew to Paris and we, you know, we tried to hide somewhere in, in, in the gym just to give my CEO the opportunity to watch the coach in action. And of course, coach didn't know that we were going. You know, it was a it was a secret secret mission of scouting. And uh, as soon as the game was over, the CEO said, "No, oh, he's our guy. I like him. I like how he relates to with players. I like it. Now let's try to connect and uh, and and try to finalize the deal." And I remember we I can't remember where, but we connected and. Uh, and at the end of a great conversation, the guy, uh, the guy asked me, so Mauricio, I mean, the guy, Zerko asked me, are you, you know, where are we? Are you okay with, uh, with uh, everything we discussed? I said, Zerko, if, if you're okay, you are our coach. And he goes, I'm okay, let's shake hands. And we shook hands. And, and the CEO who attended the dinner said, but are we going to sign anything? And, and, and Jerko looked at him and said, hey, I gave, I gave Mauricio my hand. What else do you want to sign? And then uh, we ended up signing the contract, you know, after he got to Treviso for, you know, with the start of the season. But there was no need to sign because he had shaken my hand and that was, that was the deal. So, again... Um, you look for the you not only look for x and o's you look for the uh, for what you think is the relationship you can establish the understanding by the coach of the picture you're in and the goals of your organization and the level of your organization because uh, coach needs to be comfortable with the picture that is going to end up eventually working in and and that is very, very, very important. So 
the communication is just right down my alley as as the listeners know but in in that regard when you are constantly communicating constantly uh debating arguing um just exchanging information opinions on a, on a daily basis how many times is there or like there's moments where you have to agree to disagree right there's not it's not always going to match what are the situations or the the points that you leave to the coach and what are the situations that you tell the coach to leave it up to you where that's there's a clear separation of of decision making power well I, I'm using a term that has been used uh, in many, uh, let's say, uh, Euroleague discussions lately. But no, I think um, uh, you have to hope, you have to wish to go by consensus in the sense that um, because of what I just told you, you, if you made a good analysis, your way of thinking should be fairly similar in the sense that uh, uh, the two minds should be evaluating the picture in a very similar 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 way but that doesn't mean that uh, uh, you know at the end of the day the decision cannot be seen from two different angles um, I think uh, that from my side, um, I need to underline the, the priority of respecting numbers. So uh, respecting the budget is a priority. Respecting you know, how much we can invest in any sort of operation is, is a priority. And uh, on the other side, uh, the technical side, of course, is uh, is coach's field. You know, is his kid, his kingdom. So, I I think uh, it's it's important that um, if the budget is not affected, coach feels like he has more of a decision making. Uh, let's say, power, because of course he says, okay, I stay within this, this is my, you know, I want to go for this player instead of this other player. Um, I like the fact that um, if to have a coach that anyway, even knowing this sort of, uh, let's call it decision-making power, if within your box of your budget box, uh, gives you the opportunity to understand your thinking process. So it's not one of, you know, one of those situations where I am the coach, you know, forget about your opinion. I am the coach. I decide this. If this is the approach, then um, let's say the path together can be a, strug a struggling one. Again, I, I, I used the example of Obradovic before. Every decision was always discussed, shared, and, um, and he would always listen to my point of view. And, and, but again, uh, let's say he was going his way or sometimes he would say, hey, you know what, you are right. Let's, let's take this approach. I mean, the sharing... Communication and sharing. The sharing was always uh, at the base of every decision. Then, of course, uh, uh, I felt I was always a part of this decision decision making process, and uh, I think that's that's what you have to feel to 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 be part of this decision making process. Understanding that if within your budget limitation uh, and you know, he is the coach. So he needs to put together the car that he needs to drive afterwards. So he's your pilot, you know, he's your, you know, he's your driver. So you cannot put him in a situation that he doesn't feel comfortable with the car that is put together. That is the, the philosophical, let's say, approach. So I think uh, uh, 
I think that has changed through the years, going back 40 years ago. 40 years ago, it was more the approach of, hey, we are the club, we put together this team and you coach it. Now it's, now it's different. Coach, coach has to... I like the idea of coaches knowing the numbers, knowing the budgets, understanding what we can do and what we cannot do. And uh, because again, uh, today is a, you know it's a different approach, and they need to understand the issues that we have to solve uh, in order to manage the situation at best. You know, so it it all both comes down back to communication because of the like the the juggling back and forth. It leads to clarity, right? It's like a filter. You you continuous continuously filter information and filter opinion until it's so clear that you both have no choice but to agree on a certain thing or, or completely throw it away and both agree to, to, to just... Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's, that's the most important thing. I mean, I, I can recall uh, hours and hours with every, every coach I had. Hours, I mean, put together, not, not at once, but through... I remember when I had a clinic... Uh, in uh, in Vegas for the American Coaches Association and one year and and I talked about the topic of communication and sharing with the coaches and I was telling them hey I had Mike D'Antoni for four years as a coach and Mike will at the end of the day will be probably be remembered as one of the coaches who changed the game with his way of playing it you know And, but Mike, when, when he started our career out of Milano with us in Treviso, was a, was a struggling coach coming out of a, of a, of a Milan job with, uh, let's say, with still doubts if he could turn into a successful coach. And he had uh, afterwards an amazing uh, NBA career. But I told him that those years that I spent together with him, every morning, He, would, uh, he was a very methodical person. He would stop by, you know, Treviso, as you know, is a very, very small place. He would stop by the train station, by the only copy of USA Today, uh, get to one bar place where, you know, he would get there and start doing his crossword puzzle. I would come from home. He would have his cappuccino. I would have my espresso. And we, you know, we would start talking basketball. And that was the start of our day. And every day, because that was the need of sharing. Obradovic had different habits, at least in Treviso. Obradovic, we went out after practice at night to a place in front of the arena. And we had uh, French fries, big olives and beer and talk basketball for two, three hours to the point that my wife was coming and say, was calling and say, hey, where are you? Because you disappear. No, we are here in front of the gym, just talking basketball. But, and with David, we had long, long talks. I mean, talking, sharing, discussing basketball is, is fundamental to, to, for all the decision and that you have to make and, and, and how, and for you to manage, a, you know, a basketball club. Yeah. I think, I think the key component on that is um, to be able to have the ability to be rational and not to be afraid to change your opinion on things, to be a flip-flopper to an extent, but not, not to be married to an idea, but be open to having your opinion changed by somebody else and not be stubborn on something that you think and you believe in, but you, you don't allow any other arguments to change your mind. I think it's a key component on find, finding the right solution. Uh, I think it's very important that a coach doesn't get surrounded by yes men, but it's also important that a GM doesn't have a relationship where He doesn't get, you know, a true feedback. I mean, uh, he needs to know what you think, and I need to know what he thinks. If if we all tell each other what each other would like to hear, uh, then you are you are on the wrong path. You are on the wrong path, and um, 
this is, I think, uh, one of the one of the most sensitive points because in today's business with the unpredictability of the business, unless you really are comfortable with your own success and who you are as a coach, a lot of, a lot of times it happens that uh, you feel it or you see, we go back to scouting coaches like you were mentioning before, you see and you feel that sometimes you, like in any other situation in, in life, you get the answers that they think is the nicest answer for you to hear. But then you need to know if, you know, if that is the person that you're looking for. I mean, you want to have whoever is around you telling you what he thinks in, a, in a, the most honest way. Because again, uh, sharing is, means also to have a honest comparison of opinions. And, uh, and as you said, sometimes you can agree, some, sometimes you disagree, but uh, that's how you grow. Uh, you cannot grow with uh, fake opinions because it doesn't lead you anywhere. It doesn't lead you anywhere. Absolutely. So making those decisions uh, when you are trying to find a con consensus and uh, evaluating players, because most of the time, the, not only, you know, you not only talk about the current roster, but also about scouting uh, players that may fit into your roster. Comparing your rookie eyes with your experienced eyes right now, has anything changed over the course of the year besides the experience factor coming into play? Are there certain things that you change your opinion on over time that you thought were correct back then and now you find it differently? What are the, like, the key components that you see that, that stick out to you now that may have not stuck out in the past? Huh. Nice, nice, nice question. Um... Welcome to my podcast. Yeah, right. No, that's, um, again, there is no, no, there is no perfect formula as uh, trying to, let's say, make the best possible decision. I, uh, believe it or not, I, I try, I try to stay away, not stay away, but I try not to just rely on numbers because, um, I think that there is something else beside numbers. So I have learned to uh, try to be more curious about the, the players that I eventually, or the coach that I eventually want to deal with. Try to go more in depth in, in his uh, you know, way of playing or in his career, in his personality. I am, uh, compared to the beginning, I find it very, let's say, it's much easier, of course, because of technology, but also because of connections. Uh, I find it natural to ask more questions around, to dig more into a, into a player or a coach's life, uh, to, to, you know, to gather a, a different level of information compared to, to the past. Um, again, I don't know if it's a good, uh, if it's a good, uh, you know, statement or, or not, uh, because I don't want to give the wrong impression. So don't, don't misunderstand me. But I remember when I, when I arrived in Treviso, you know, 30 years ago in Benetton and, uh, and I thought, that I would have never had a chance to run such a, uh, you know, high level program. They were, you know, getting top level players, but, and they were also getting, you know, quality young players. And, and my, you know, I was coming from a, my hometown experience with very limited budgets with le very limited opportunities. And my question was, would I, would I ever be able to, you know, grade the talent to understand when the player really fits this type of level of uh, playing, uh, this type of uh, dreams, this type of goals, you know, how, how, you know, how long, 
I was really hesitant as my ability to, to find uh, the gems that could fit the program, to find uh, you know, the future of, uh, uh, you know, of, of the franchise. You know, to, you know, I, but I have to say that um, you, know, you talked about rookie eyes. Uh, when I see a player, you know, and maybe you have the same feeling as a, as a veteran scout, but when you see the player, it doesn't take too long to have something inside that tells you he can play or he cannot play. You know, to me, it's a very quick, quick process. And if, if that uh, initial impression is positive, then I become um, more and more curious at gathering uh, additional, let's say, information. But in general, um, Again, I my first my first impression tells me a lot of things when I when I see a play, and uh, you know, and of course I respect numbers, I respect technology, I respect everything. But uh, players is also something beyond that, uh, you know, uh, the intangibles, uh, how he fits in a team, how he communicates, what he brings to the table. Is he a is he a team player? Is selfish? No selfish. Uh, can he be a tough guy? Is he, is he something that is uh, not tough enough? You know, these are the things that bring to an evaluation. You know? So let's talk about a little bit because the, the roster can be made up of, of many different uh, roles, you know, whether it's a leadership role, defensive role, uh, specific, you know, specific tools that it brings to the table. But in terms of what you said, the information gathering, I'm, I'm interested because this is, this is one of the key components also in, 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 for an NBA franchise. But in general, I think that it's undervalued in Europe to an extent where people are <laughs> more afraid to talk about somebody because of the fear of something coming out the other way. Who said what about, about the, this, this person? or this player rather, how do you go about selecting the right sources to ask? And what questions are your most favorite to ask about the player that you're evaluating? Are there like two, two components to this yeah, question? No, I'm, I understand, let's say your concern, not yours, but again, the, the person in search of, a, of information, but, and we're going to another, it's a concept of, you know, along these big words that we are using, challenge, communication, sharing. The other one is network. And uh, networking is, is vital in order, especially since you get started in this business and as you, as you go through. And uh, it's a very important part of our job as managers to work on our network to establish, uh, let's say, a chain of communication that, uh, that gives you at least, as you, as you try to, to this, an honest opinion and um, in a comfortable way. So they trust your word, I trust their word. We know that we're not gonna let's say, gossiping around anything, but we're trying to, to help each other. And, um, Circle of trust. Right. I think that that's very important. It takes time. It takes uh, friendship. It takes uh, or real relationships. But um, again, uh, I know that it's easy for me after 40 years in this business to talk about this. And I can imagine younger people who are just getting started. But the concept is, doesn't change. You have to work on your network. And today, you have, let's say, help that you, you did not help 40 years ago. What I'm saying is, you have a base that is represented by the use of technology that you can use all the time. I mean, uh, uh, you can build a picture of a player just get, gathering information on the web. And that's a big advantage. Then you have, you know, many more people, many more eyes in the business that are scouting, 
or there are uh, uh, even um, scouting for different purposes. What I'm saying is there are not only the scouts that are working for NBA clubs or European clubs. Now there are scouts that are, let's say, working for their own basketball academies. Now there are scouts that are working for uh, agencies. Now there are scouts working to bring players to NCAA. There are all sorts of scouts in this business. So all, many more people that you can think, hey, and I'm not counting the media people because there are also uh, many more uh, websites uh, specifically on, on scouting, many more people working around, traveling around to gather information. But you have a wide variety of potential contacts that you can somehow uh, understand if they can help you in, in your research. And you have an opportunity to uh, understand which are the quality relationships that can develop out of this picture. Maybe none, maybe many. Um, you know, I, I think networking is fundamental because again, I don't have, I don't even have a problem contacting directly the GM that was managing the player the previous year, just to have a share, understanding that they don't want him anymore. So I, I play always very transparent, but, but I think that if you develop some friendship in a, in, in, let's say, if you develop your own network, you always have a way to find information more in depth about any, any player, any player, because also uh, beside this uh, scouting picture of all different types, there are also so many other connections that you can find in the basketball business, because the basketball business at the end of the day is a small community that gives you the opportunity to gather extra information. So, so what, what would be like one of the key key questions you ask in your network that are, I, I understand it varies from player to player and from, from the situation that he was on before, because you have to evaluate the context that the player was in. Some context does not fit him. And sometimes the clubs or the, the managers on one team experience a completely different side of a player than yeah, the other no, team I does. Would, I, again, at the end of the day, it's a matter of asking what's the, what he can bring to the table on the other, on the opposite end, what's the biggest minus, you know, the most negative thing. And, and if there is the question is, what should I know that I don't know? You know, what's, you know, or why, you know, why are they letting him go or why they don't offer him the offer? What's the minus that is affecting this sort of decision or this sort of picture? If you understand that the minus is only money related, you feel okay because it's just negotiation, it's just business. But if you're starting to understand that there are some other factors, then you have to be in a position to understand how they those factors affect your picture. Let's say not a not the right teammate, not exactly uh, uh, you know a player that has great relationship with the coaching staff or that can, can break the locker room apart or, uh, uh, you know, bad uh, eating habits or, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if the relationship with your source is honest, he needs to tell you what you don't know about the player. Okay. You have to tell him, hey, I know this and this and this. What do I, what am I missing at, in my analysis? And yeah. that's where he helps you. Okay, very good. That's those. That's very valuable. And you you mentioned you mentioned um, you know like the the websites that now exist now, the information flow that's out there. How much how much like if you could put percentages on how much scouting versus reading do you do? Like how much you know putting putting uh, uh, just pure watching tape into hours in versus reading, gathering information and and understanding of of the 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 you know what's what's out there in the public well I, I i think that we have to always you know 
watch as much basketball as possible, no matter which uh, position in an organization we are holding, but we need to try to watch as much basketball as possible. That's as a basic rule. Of course, you are a scout, you can watch basketball 24 seven, you are a manager, the time is, is more limited. So um, first rule, as I said, watch as much basketball as possible. Second, again, in an organization, uh, you have to try to put together some tools that help your analysis, whether it's a simple database, whether it's what your scouts can bring to the table in terms of information. Um, again, I, I like to watch basketball. I like to follow more or less all the leagues in Europe to understand what the new names are. At that point, I try to gather information of the names that are standing out just to understand if there is more that I should know about this, um, uh, let's say newcomers or these or these players who are playing so well. I try to connect with, uh, let's say, my scouting component in order to gather information. I look at the numbers, but as I said before, um, I don't trust the numbers only. I, I try to look at my overall uh, season schedule, see if there is any chance to stop by a game. So working on the schedule is important to see if there are extra opportunity of scouting. Uh, but again, it's uh, uh, today's technology helps you a lot because uh, you can watch games all the time, whether it's live or, uh, or not live. You can break down the plays. You can see uh, two hours of pick and rolls of all the players you're interested in, as an example. Uh, you can do things that once upon a time were uh, impossible to even think that could, could happen. But you need to have the time to analyze all this. You need to have the time to discuss a player's character. And, you know, and, and I think all this together gives you the, the value of your uh, scouting job, you know, like, uh, and, and the understanding if this is, is a potential candidate for your puzzle or not. So quick practical, practical maybe um, suggestions for the listeners. Is there, are there certain programs you prefer to use to, to put the information in one place? Whether it's, I mean, maybe you have a, a, a database for the club or maybe for you personally that you have gathered over the years, maybe in Excel, Excel or Evernote, or I don't know what program maybe you prefer to use. Uh, what's, is there something that you like to... Uh... No, we, you know, we have a very, very simple database and uh, we try to focus on the players that we truly have interest in, on. Uh, because otherwise it would become too, too you know, too big of a study yeah, to yeah. follow. I mean, it would be, we try to collect, for example, every season, as you may imagine, there are moments that you are thinking about replacing one player or you have to cope with an injury. Any, anyone that we discuss during the season becomes part of our database because uh, you know, since we're going to do an in-depth work on this guy, uh, then we keep the work in our, in our, let's say, database. And, uh, but we try to keep it, to keep it simple. I mean, uh, not thousands of names because that doesn't help, uh, you know, doesn't help our, 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 our work. But, right. uh, again, uh, we have like, a a season recap every year. And, uh, uh, and we, we like to see the thinking process that took us to this player. Why did we think is what it stopped us? Now, it, it's, it's not good for me to mention names or to tell stories because this is very sensitive field, but I could tell you uh, stories of, of great evaluations or, and poor evaluation. Because what is uh, what I think is very true is that scouting 
whether it is webs, web opportunities, whether it's numbers, whether it's information, lead you to making as, let's say, to improve the quality of your decision, to make less mistakes in your decision-making process. But that being said, you're still making mistakes. So <laughs> it's, it's not that, the game. I mean, it's part of the game. I mean, uh, this is good for Fenerbahce, but it's true for uh, Boston and the Lakers. I mean, it's true for everybody. You work, 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 uh, trying to make the best possible decision, and then you realize all of a sudden, what did I decide? What, why did we do the, it happens, it happens. Uh, the, dra the draft is full of mistakes, right? I mean, there's, there's always... I, you know, uh, I think, uh, again, I, I could give you a lot of, let's say, examples in my, in my years as a GM, where I was very proud of certain uh, decisions and... Uh, and then I said, damn, I, I, I could have made this, I could have made this. And uh, uh, again, and sometimes you don't know, you know, uh, you know, it takes very little to make a, a decision this way or the other way. And it changes uh, a coaches and players life just like this and your, your own life as a manager. Yes. Too, you know? So, but um, again, we must understand that we can we can make we can make we can make mistakes. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's part of the game. So our our time is slowly winding down. But before we go into my quick ATOs, I wanted to have one more topic addressed as as a final four topic that I've you know experienced myself and experienced obviously uh, more of a, a deflating <laughs> part. You know, so. There's the part of winning, but there's also more often than not, usually you also come back home after losing the final four, whether it's semifinal, whether it's final. What I, It's a very sensitive uh, time, whether it's before the final four, it's very, very um, uh, sensitive, but it's also after the final four because you still have to play the, the, the domestic league playoffs. What are some things that you do to pick up the team after you come back and have a, you know, not a happy ending at your hand and you have to pick up the team with maybe certain things that you do to, to get their mind off, off of the past weekend? Well, um, not too long ago, not too long ago, I, I'm, you know, about a month ago, there was a major sport meeting that is a, is organized by Gazzetta dello Sport in Trento. And uh, they have all sorts of uh, big time champions going through that and share their stories, you know, from, I don't know, I'm talking about global, global people, you know, Lindsey Vaughn rather than, I don't know, uh, t top, you know, football players, uh, Del Piero, whatever. This year, one of the, because it's over a few days, this year, one of the nights was on basketball. And, uh, and the basketball guest was Tony Kukoc. And he was surrounded also by some of his teammates in Treviso, uh, you know, uh, Pelacani, Jacopini, Vianini, you know, the people that were in Treviso. And I was the GM of that team. And uh, we went to play the final four in Athens. And um, we felt like, okay, it was a great experience. We had the, you know, the, probably the best player in Europe at that time. And, uh, but still we didn't really, uh, you know, measure our, our chances. So you can imagine playing in Athens with full arena and beating, you know, the two favorite teams were Pauk Saloniki playing in Athens and Real Madrid with Sabonis. And um, you can imagine us beating Saloniko on the final last second shot by Richard Agassi 
and make it to the final. And Limoges surprising uh, Real Madrid and make it to the final. So all of a sudden, we went from being happy to be there to being somehow favorite to win the game. And you can imagine when you go through the game until the final possession and you think you can win the cup and you don't win it. And because, uh, you know, Forte steals the ball to Tony Kukuc, they, you know, you know, and the game is over. And um, I've never seen, okay, that was probably the, Tony Kukuc described it as the biggest disappointment in his career. And he had come from winning three Euro leagues from Dominion. Then he would have gone on to win NBA championship. And he said, that was the biggest disappointment in my career. I have to say that I had the same feeling that if I look at my life, that was the biggest disappointment in, in, in my career. And I never seen so many players crying for so long after a basketball game, crying, but real tears whether it was Rusconi or Jacopini or all the other, all the other players. It was a devastating night. So you can imagine the roller coaster of emotions. And going back to your question, the need to regroup and try to do well in the domestic season. And uh, it was not easy. It was not easy. And I think the message as, as club, as manager, was always trying to, to explain that getting to the final stage of the best competition, the final four, is already like reaching an incredible result because you are in, you know, top of the cream. I mean, you are, you are uh, with, the best, with the best clubs in the season, you have reached already a season goal. You are with the best. That's something that will always stay in the history of your club. But sometimes you accept this, sometimes you don't accept this because players, uh, you know, they can come very, very, very disappointed. And uh, uh, we had years where we regrouped and were able to win the domestic championship. We had years, I remember one year with the brother, which we didn't make it. We came back into the domestic season and we got surprised by Reggio Emilia, who was number, number eight, one against eight. And we, you know, and we were eliminated from the domestic league because the emotional element is so, so big, so huge, that it's not easy to overcome in a positive way. It takes mature people to say, okay, yes, we achieved something now. Let's go on to, to finish the season the best possible way. So to your point, is, there is not a, not a, let's say, a perfect formula. And, and selling, selling the importance of reaching the Final Four as a, as, a, as a top place to be is important to do after, but it's very important to do before you get, you get to play it. So they understand that they have achieved something and they also maybe calm down a little bit, trying, trying to, to do the best possible job, you know. Try, trying to decompress them before, yes. before the fact. Yes. All right. You ready for my ATOs? You ready for... Oh, for... Again. Let, let's, let's hear. All right. Um, so the, the first one, um, if you had to teach a class today that's not on basketball, what would it be on? Well... Personally, personally, I like history. <laughs> that would be that would be my you know I've always been passionate about history. Certain part epoch? Any any certain particular particular? Well, area? again, I'm I like history in, in general, but uh, maybe um, maybe okay, 19th century would you know would be more you know because it's more recent. But again, I like history. Study the, let's say, study how the, you know, things evolved through the years. I think it would be history, yeah. What are, what are some things that some, most executives pay too much attention to? Hey. Um, 
Well, I think uh, it's I would say maybe it's not a simple statement to explain, but I don't want to elaborate on it, but I, th I think it would be uh, they they pay more attention to what it looks than in actually to what it is. What do they pay too little attention to? Um, the need of uh, understanding what uh, uh, that no matter what your own interest is, uh, you need to stay within your, uh, let's say, your dimension. Uh, sometimes our, our in general, I'm not talking about anybody, I mean, including myself, we, we are taking too much by trying to reach the goal, no matter what it takes. Instead, we need to think that uh, we need to be using good sense in every decision we make. Don't, don't get ahead of yourself, basically. Yes, yes. Okay. If not basketball, GM, what would your occupation be right now? My, my, okay. I, I didn't. Your occupation, what would your occupation be if not uh, basketball, Jim? I'd like to be a MotoGP manager. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last, last one is a quote that I found uh, by your Forley president back in the, in, in the days. And uh, maybe you can elaborate or have a finishing statement on that. Uh, at the end of the day, the big fish always eats up the small fish. But as a small fish, you may be able to be eaten right away. Well, um, I remember those times, um, you know, like it goes back to the point that I just made in a way. Um, we need to understand uh, the dimension of our own business and understanding that sometimes we cannot be in a position to, um, uh, you know, to control certain decisions. So. We need to understand that if we face a situation that is not leading us to the control of, this, of, the, of the, the decision, then we might be better off understanding that it's better to find a way to get the most out of this situation. And, uh, and that actually happened in my own town team because our, our club, we. We had a very small budget and sometimes we landed some good players that at the end of the day we could not control. And it happened a few times through the 14, 15 years with Benetton because we developed many young players that actually at the end of the day ended up being uh, becoming uh, great players in, in Europe or interesting prospect and with NBA careers back in the NBA. So we needed to understand our dimension. And selecting like the president said the best way to to be eaten to give up your asset because at least you get more out of it and you can invest in the rest of your of your activity you know correct Maurizio thank you very much I hope I didn't squeeze you too much I hope that that you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did and our I'm sure our listeners and viewers as well Thank you, Benas, for the opportunity. I wish you the best and wish our paths can cross during the, during the season. They will. They will, Great. for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.